Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to a special edition of the Ladies Shining Podcast. This is Stephen Spector, and with me, as usual, is Rob Hirschfeld. Hello, Rob. Hello, Stephen. And we have brought back our favorite open source guest, I have to say that, Vicki Berser. Vicki, hello. How are you? Well, hi. Uh, I'm really enjoying the nice, cool weather now in Portland. Yes, when I was there two weeks ago for vacation at 98 degrees, it was lovely. Uh, <laughs> yes. Just yeah. lovely. We, we're doing a special thing for uh, the announcement by Redis Labs today where they changed their licensing. And uh, Rob or Vicki, why don't you just quickly, uh, you know, kind of state what they did and then we can uh, talk about it from there. Besides piss a whole bunch of people off and create yes, a whole bunch of internet they, noise. Vicki, do you want to define what they did? <laughs> uh, so uh, what Redis did, and I, I'll just be really honest here, there is nothing wrong from a business perspective for, with what Redis did. So very clear about that. From what I can tell, from what little I know, there's nothing wrong from a business perspective. From an open source and community perspective, holy crap, what the heck were you people thinking? What they did is they uh, took several certain components, according to the blog post, certain components uh, of Redis, and they switched license to, um, I forget from what, doesn't matter at this point. They switched from maybe Apache. AGPL, I, I believe. Okay, so they switched from AGPL to uh, Apache 2 with something called the Commons Clause. And the Commons Clause is where I actually get my knickers in a twist. So um, uh, what the Commons Clause does is it says, nobody can use this software if they're going to make money off of it in any way whatsoever. And the Commons Clause is very, very, very vaguely worded such that it's impossible to tell what really you can use it for or not. And I think it's it's a landmine, legally speaking, and it is fopen washing. It's faux open source. So it is creating something that looks like open source because open, uh, the source is available. And it is fundamentally using an open source license, Apache V2 in this case, but it is not open source because people are not allowed to make money off of it. So that is just very deceptive to use this particular license. It is, in essence, a proprietary license. You have closed the source code. So that is what Redis did, and um, for, but for only certain components. I got to be very clear here, core Redis is now, and according to one of their core developers, will always be openly licensed under, I believe, BSD3. So if you are a Redis user, don't worry. Redis itself is open and theoretically should stay open. But for myself, I feel my trust in that has been degraded by the way they have handled this. It was very poorly messaged. And that is what got everybody up in arms. The poor <laughs> message around it. They yeah. did that very badly. It, it definitely, I, I, I like your, your description of it. I, I'm going to play the part of a, of a Redis defender a bit for what we're doing um, and, and to, I think, help this conversation because I, I certainly don't think it's useful to have a, a Redis dog pile, which is what Twitter seemed to oh, yeah. become. Uh, and there, there were some really well thought out Twitter rants, some blog posts. I, I think that you know, if you read about this, you can see it. I, what I what I would love to do is is sort of step back because our conversation, our longer conversation that people should definitely listen to, really talked about the you know maintaining the source and building community and and creating an ecosystem where the maintainers of the code could make money. And in the post where Redis said we're changing the license, they were very emphatic about the free rider problem, and worse, they felt that companies like Amazon that were offering pay services based on Redis open source software were basically taking advantage of Redis. It was that, is that a fair, do you think that, that sort of summarizes their commercial uh, position? They did make that statement um, and I, I totally respect that. But what I do not know is what they did before relicensing, which was essentially a great big, you know, fuck you to everyone. Um, they, I wrote a blog post about it yesterday, day before, immediately afterward. I don't know, time has lost meaning. I wrote a blog post about it, which said, well, it looks like what you did is you got your knickers in a twist, you took your ball and you went home because people weren't playing by the rules that you thought they should be playing by. Now, 
that's fine if you have taken the time to go to them and say, hey, could you contribute? Hey, what is blocking you from contributing? Hey, can we collaborate? And I don't know whether any of that happens. It may have, it may not have. I think people who are trying to, who are putting, who are putting Redis in the stocks for this, who are pillaring them, mm -hmm. they don't have any more information than anyone else. And people who are bitching about Redis doing this don't have the full picture. I don't have the full picture. I can't tell you that Redis did the wrong thing. They may have, they may not. I don't know because I don't know what they did before relicensing. So, so did any, oh, Rob, I was gonna ask. No, no, any, so did any of the companies like Amazon, for example, was there a response from any of the companies that are using Redis that would be impacted by this? I'm curious, did they speak out? I don't know. I haven't seen any. Rob, have you seen any? I haven't seen any any of the users who, you know, Redis is basically, you know, you know, pointing the finger at would be the way I describe it here. Coming back and, and saying it, and and I, I, Vicky, I suspect there isn't. I'd be I'd be amazed if there was a, a, a friendly relationship between the people who are who are, you know, offering Redis services, in in competition with Redis Labs and what Redis is doing. In some parts, this is and we we have podcasts about this, so I don't want to dwell on it. This is the death of of you know, not licensed software. Uh, versus SaaS software. And so it, I, I can definitely see them being frustrated. And they're not the only ones, right? I hear in open source communities, we hear a lot about major cloud providers embedding open software as a service, right? MySQL is a famous one that, that people talk about, right? And then not, not paying back the, the companies that are trying to maintain those code bases. Is, do you think that you know, this would be solved if Amazon was saying, hey, you know, we're making this amount, we should set aside 5% of, of our boot, of our, you know, profits to, to send back to the maintainers of the projects? No, because you're trying to solve a people problem with money. <laughs> people problem and from a maintainer's problem or a community problem? All of the above. Redis feels ill-used because they are shouldering the entire burden of maintaining this uh, very large code base. Right. Right. That's not necessarily a money thing. That's a community thing. That is other people using the software and not contributing back. That is a people problem. And that's why I would like to know what sort of people level approaches did they try before going for licensing or a technical approach. Right. And I, I don't know that. And I don't think anyone outside of Redis Labs does know that. So we can't I, really fully criticize them without that information. I, I can tell you things that I've been observing from Redis's journey because right, Redis has been building enterprise products on top of the Redis base. And those products have enterprise capabilities, right? Um, Multi-user, you know, higher scale. Redis itself is not a multi-threaded platform, so there's scale bottlenecks in it. Right, and, and my understanding is Redis, is Redis Labs has had a version that solves those problems. And, and I think that if that version is open source and somebody and other people are picking it up to offer it as a service, then we've, you know, they've created a problem for themselves, I guess. Yes, yes, they have. I, I, if what they have done is had an open core business model and they have found over experimentation in years that what they have done is had too large of a core and they need to trim that core back some right. that's that's just standard business administration and business operation is Which, that effectively it, what they're doing though i mean could could this it, commons clause be just basically moving so to... from what i see yes that is what they're doing but i don't have any insights into it it does appear that that is what they're doing and they are making a smaller core taking some things closed source. The uh, inventor of this commons clause thing does say, and I, I have no problem with Redis, they're doing what they need to do for the business. I have endless amounts of problems with commons clause, so I, I won't even hide that. He does mm. say that commons clause is intended as a middle point between open source and proprietary closed source. 
And so it's supposed to be a stopping point on the way to relicensing to make it source available but proprietary. What he does not realize, and this is what blows my mind, by adding the commons clause, what you have essentially done is both relicensed it under a proprietary closed source license, which is where you're headed eventually anyway, but it's also you have doubled your relicensing effort because now you've got to relicense to this middle thing, which right. by the way is closed and proprietary and then relicense to a closed and proprietary license. It just doesn't make any sense at all from a business perspective. It takes so much time and effort to relicense. Why would you waste that with this, this really uh, deceptive open source, open washing thing in the middle? Well, so I, I mean, taking Redis's perspective on this, they have customers who, you know, they've committed that the source would be open. I can see them saying, we're not taking the source away from you. You go use it, right? What we're really trying to do is, is block these commercial, and we talked about free riders in our, our long podcast. Yeah, but you can do the exact same thing by jumping directly to a proprietary license and saying, from this point on this version, we are now using this license. You get the source because you expect it. And here is your new EULA. Sign mm -hmm. that, continuing going forward. It's the, this, this is just muddying the waters and it's confusing everything, including probably their customers. And one of the things I, I sort of like about the debate is open source itself is confusing because people are like, well, you can see my source code. It's open. And you're making a very clear point that open source code, open source really means I have a license that allows reuse and adaptation. And right. And, and so you're, you're right. This this not, isn't an open source license from the fact that somebody can could not commercialize this code in any way they want. You've restricted that. And so, yeah, from that perspective, what you're really doing is asserting your copyright in a way that's not open. They could just change their license to Redis Labs restricted use, make the gets, make the, the repos open so that everybody can see the code and, and just run with it from there. And, and exactly. do and that all the time. Which, frankly, uh, if you look at the Unity game engine, they do that. You can look at the Unity source code. It's available under a proprietary license, but it is source available. And that's what we call this. There is open source, which allows you all of the freedoms of open, free and open source software. And then there is source available where you can just see the code. And these are two completely different things because you can do a lot with open source. And you can't really do quite as much with source available. You can't really do anything with that, with source available with in, in, you know, without running into legal potential legal risk. That's well, a, you can yeah, see a, how APIs work. You can see how code is working. You can, you know, if, if you're trying to write a game, for instance, with Unity, you can use that to write plugins more effectively. So those plugins themselves can be open source under an OSI approved open source license. Right. But Unity itself is not, and that's that's their business decision, and I support that. Right. And, and, and the source available makes a ton of sense. Somebody might say, I have a patch or a fix for you. And this came up in, in some of the commentary I saw, right? You can submit patches back. You're just giving up the trademark or the, pro, your, the rights when, if they take your patch. Which is different. It's, that's, open, even open source is wonky from that perspective. Yeah, no, that's, that's an oversimplification. Um, you can submit a patch to anyone regardless. I can submit a Correct. patch to Windows 10 right now. Microsoft is not under an obligation to take it, but if they do, they get to set the terms under which they take it. And those might be open source terms. They might not. I might retain my copyright. I might not, but it is my copyright. So it is my choice to say whether I will accept those terms. And if not, fine, they don't merge my patch. That's the way these things work. When I read this, my head, I mean, everything we're talking about, licenses and open source and source available makes perfect sense. And at the same time, especially as a company that's doing open source work, my, my head went to the commercial struggle for, for making this happen. Are, are we in a, just moving into a case where it's just really hard for companies, the popular projects to monetize? Is well, that honey, it's never been easy. 
It has never been easy. If you look <laughs> at the open core companies that are out there, almost none of them have developed successful standalone products. The only exit they get that it can be considered successful is acquisition. So if you look at the history of open core, it is not quite as rosy as people would like to think. And, and I would take, I would have listeners who are depending on open source software, which is 100% of technology companies today, mm -hmm. think through the, the, the challenge that we have, that if you're depending on software that's running in an open core path, if it's not, if it's not being supported some way, or even if it is, it's going to end up needing to have a larger company home riding it. And I think this no. is one of the challenges. No, no it doesn't. How does, how does, no, it, it, how does well, a company why, like Curtis Lab survive? Why do, why do we keep coming back to companies? Okay. Why does a, a large project require a company to support it? You were in OpenStack. I was. You had the foundation. So you had an entire host of companies that could support it. Right. It, it doesn't is, necessarily uh, have to have corporate funding to make it happen. Stephen, yes. Are you going to cut us off? You're, he's no, but us. I, I was going to comment on that because, you know, so I get the OpenStack model because that's a lot of companies coming together. But in the case of Redis, it was, I think it was this, a guy, I forget, I don't know his name, although we did do a Redis podcast. Everyone should go back and listen to it. But, you know, <laughs> he chose to build a product around an open source thing. And I guess other companies could have done the same thing. Maybe that model is broken and that's not I, the right I way. Would, I would think my, so you caught me on either a good day or a bad day, depending upon your point of view. I'm in the middle of a uh, blog post that I'm, I'm it, it's a rage induced blog post. Awesome. Um, and it is all about how open source is not a business model. Stop fucking saying it is. <laughs> The development uh, and licensing. So, um, so mm -hmm. yeah, there's, I think that there, you can absolutely positively make money out of free and open source software. All I have to do is just point at Red Hat. But I can use one finger and point at one company that has done this. And what we get after that is a lot of open core models. So I think that what we need to do is stop thinking that if I open it, people will come and people will give me money. Now we need to start learning how to run a fucking business. <laughs> and that is not something we can lay at the feet of open source. And yet everybody seems to be doing that. And that's a big problem. Yeah. For Redis, it could be that they were just keeping their uh, chips a little too close to the chest and they were not themselves reaching out and looking for collaborators, or maybe they were and everyone else was holding them at arm's length. Again, I don't know that information. Regardless, it does come down to they were the only ones working on this particular code. This is evinced by the fact that they are able to relicense so easily. That means they are holding all the copyright. They're the only ones playing in this sandbox, and I gotta wonder why. Because if that problem is they are the only ones where playing in this sandbox, then what have they done to, to attract other kids to their sandbox? And I don't know the answer to that question, and neither does anyone else. But it is a fundamental question that all uh, open core projects and open core companies need to work on. Because if you are the only one who is maintaining your project, why not just keep it proprietary? And I, with that, Rob, I'm going to cut you and Vicky off. For those listeners who hear this, when I push it out next week, both Vicky and I will be in Vancouver at the Open Source Summit. I'm going to push this out in the middle of it. And so if you have questions, certainly I would recommend you go to Vicky. I'm happy to answer them and give you a strange look. But I would certainly <laughs> say it way. And if you listen to this podcast, then you probably have listened to the Vicky podcast that we pushed out four or five days earlier uh, this weekend because we're, we're giving you a double dose but with Open Source Summit. But, uh, you know, I... Great respect, and, and I really like to listen to what Vicky has to say, so we're, we're going to heat it up, and hopefully if you're listening to both of these, start following our podcast and learning other things, but Vicky, thank you so much for jumping on, even in your middle of your blogging. I do think uh, there is something about, again, we talked about this, Rob, before, about someone needs to do a PhD research on, on using open source and variety of business models around it, 
And you know, you so, said you were going to send me. I'm I'm getting my application ready. That Joseph Joseph Jack's research is amazing and very thoughtful, and people should people should check that out. Um, I, I would love to have more conversations uh, about this with other people. This is a uh, you know, Vicky has a ton of passion about this, which I love. Yeah, um, I agree with. We we need but we have to have these discussions, and we have to come turn it around and say. It's a business model. We better figure out how to make it work because I, I, I'm worried that a lot of great open source projects are going to not survive, and that's not good for us. Yeah, so if you, I, I if think. You, yeah. If you listen to this and you want to talk with us, you know, again, reach out to myself or Rob, Vicky. If they come up to you and they want to argue it, let them know we're happy to have them on. Hey, if they want to debate, <laughs> you, we're ready. Uh, yeah, <laughs> we're ready. I, I'm actually not big on debating. So um, podcast jousting. No, no opinions at all for Vicky. I, I can see that. <laughs> yeah, she doesn't have opinions. Well, I, I have both. opinions. Yes. Okay. Thanks, Stephen. <laughs> thank you both. And to our listeners, uh, if you listen to this, even if you aren't happy, unhappy, and you listen, stop by and let me know. I'll be running around the event, or Vicky, and say, "Hey, I heard you guys on the podcast." It lets us know that we do have a variety of listeners, and uh, we're hoping that this. Uh, makes your drive or your walk to work uh, better than it would have been listening to bad, bad pop music. So thanks again to both of you. Be good to your dogs and yes. cats. Okay. All Bye. right. Hey.